we will move on sure. now um, to uh, again to some folks who really um, have have a ton of experience, um, and so we're pleased to have um, Stefan Hartman and Eric Werkler of Earthlight Technologies. So Stefan has solar development experience in residential, commercial, uh, nonprofit, and municipal applications. He oversaw successful residential solarized campaigns in 15 different municipalities across Connecticut and New York many of which later enlisted his help in developing and installing solar for various town buildings and schools. Stefan is familiar with municipal project planning and decision-making processes, helping renewable energy advocates plan for success in their respective communities. Eric Verkler is the Director of Commercial Solar at Earthlight. Graduating from University of Connecticut in 2000 with a structural engineering degree, Eric obtained his professional engineer's license and spent most of his career designing bridges and buildings before entering the solar field in 2015. He's been helping businesses and schools alike lower their energy costs through solar ever since. So over to Stephen and uh, to um, Stefan and Eric. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Stefan Hartman, as Mark was saying, and I've got uh, Eric with me as well. Um, Eric, you want to go ahead and get those slides going? Thanks. Yep. That work for everybody? All right, so for, fortunately, some of this is gonna be a uh, review from Karen, uh, Kieran's really great presentation. So we'll, we'll, we'll skip through some of these a little bit more quickly. Um, we're, we're gonna try to change the perspective a little bit from the developer's side uh, to help um, anybody who's looking to advocate for such projects consider that uh, you know the, the companies that are gonna be tackling these challenges head on um, or can provide a lot of insight as to how to plan for that success uh, before you start knocking on doors of your town officials offices and and trying to, uh, to plant the seed of an idea just just by Thanks, way of Jeff. introduction sure so uh, good morning everyone we're excited to see all of the interest here um, solar car partners for your community do they make sense for you it all depends on your situation and we're gonna to touch on some of the reasons that our clients are excited to have us install them. Um, if car cores are important to you, and I'm assuming they are, or you wouldn't be here today, we're gonna to help you learn about how you can go about financing them. And then just as importantly, or even more importantly, find out how you can be assured of a quality installation. So we'll spend the next three minutes or so reviewing these topics in detail, and then spending a little bit of time about explaining who Workflight is and, and why it's worth even listening to what we have to say. Here's just a, a quick look at the Earthlight team. We're a family-owned company located in Ellington. We started with a small residential carport in 2015 and since have installed solar carports of every shape and size. I'll touch on Earthlight more at the end and instead, Stefan will jump right into talking about the carports, which is really why you're here. Yeah, so to circle back around to some of the points that Kieran made, uh, there are a lot of reasons why a solar carport corp or a canopy uh, would be desirable to, in your community. Um, and so just as a quick review, it's an efficient use of space. Uh, you're not looking to go and clear any acreage or, or allocate land that could be used for other recreational things or other productive measures. Um, so those impermeable surfaces that Kieran was talking about. Uh, also the maintenance benefits, there can be, uh, so to kind of touching on what Tim, uh, the point he made about the maintenance, uh, in, in that case, it sounds like it was a challenge because I think it was a missed opportunity to provide uh, for some uh, some, ice, some icing control. So that could have been designed into it as well. Similarly, the access to the solar panels, uh, it's, quite, uh, it's quite easy to get to. So over the course, of the life of that system and the maintenance costs could be a little bit lower, less intrusive, uh, their exterior. Uh, you can go to the next slide now too, Eric. Um, and that uh, kind of leads into the customizable nature of them as well. So whether you're looking to mitigate water or snow or ice, uh, if you wanna add some lighting, uh, security systems, uh, obviously the in, in environmental benefits and the, I'm sorry, not the environmental benefits, the, uh, uh, the meteorological benefits, right? You can keep, your employees or visitors of the buildings uh, comfortable. I keep the it, so you can design that functionality right into the system. Uh, and then finally, uh, of course, I think a big reason why a lot of us are here is we want to reduce our carbon footprint. 
and see what we can do to uh, advance the renewable initiatives, uh, in particular in our state of Connecticut. So just a couple of examples. I think we, this is generally what we think of when we think of a, a solar canopy or solar carport. Uh, the accessibility, so here's a couple of our beautiful trucks under there. It, it, these things are pretty tall. So whether it's a truck or some other uh, large uh, piece of equipment, uh, these systems can be customized to accommodate pretty much anything you need to cover. And in this case, if we needed to get up there and address any of the panels or sometimes the inverters are mounted up on those columns as well, uh, it makes it easy for a contractor to come in and address any issues uh, if these systems are gonna be operating for 20 to 30 years. Uh, this is a long span installation, so it just shows, again, look at the size of those trucks down there. Uh, this uh, USA uh, hauling customer of ours really needed something that would cover a large area as well as have a very uh, high clearance for their trucks. So that system was able to be custom designed for functionality first, and then the, the energy harvest obviously is there. Uh, in addition to that, this project was, just as an aside, was coupled with a rooftop array. You can look a little bit farther back into the photo there, uh, we actually used the facility's roof as well. Um, and uh, that helped get them even more of a, of, a, of a financial benefit out of the system. Uh, and then circling back around to the point that Kieran made, we, you know, we do ground mounts and roof mounts as well. And uh, I think this image is beautiful. I mean, obviously the landscape, this is one of our, I believe this is an Oregon installation because we are bi-coastal. Uh, this installation uh, had to basically reserve that acreage for the next two to three decades. Um, so that's, that's fine if a community or a business in this case uh, is comfortable allocating that land for such a project, you can certainly save money, uh, but money isn't the only cost here. Uh, over the next you know, 20 to 30 years, there could be a myriad of reasons why that land could have been used for something else. So a carport helps to control that unknown and limit that soft cost. And then, of course, uh, the rooftop installations, which we all know is to be very popular and straightforward, but it does require a condition that is more happenstance than, than, uh, than what you had intended when the building was constructed. Uh, in this case, the building is, is uh, open and clear. There's no visual implications because there's a parapet. Uh, so it really just comes down to keeping that cost low, the system reliability up, and getting that energy harvest. Um, but if you don't have that, uh, if your roof has a lot of uh, you know, compressor, condenser units on the roof, or maybe a lot of uh, other uh, mechanical equipment, uh, that could actually uh, create challenges and increase costs, uh, increase costs to the array. Um, so being lucky becomes a part of it when you're looking at your roof. Earlier in the year, we completed this carport installation for the town of Vernon which provides covered parking to both their police station and their elementary school. The town had two main reasons for wanting these solar carports. One, save the taxpayers money on their electric bills while simultaneously reducing their carbon footprint, which goes towards their community's sustainability goals. And two, which Tim White had mentioned earlier, in the wintertime, it was difficult to maintain a fleet readiness of the police vehicles. So by covering the area, Vernon improved that situation requiring less time to get the vehicles ready. And then also extending a little bit the life of that fleet by protecting them from the elements, whether it be the elements in the summer or the sunshine and the, and the heat in the summertime. Two, two important items to note here, which um, Tim actually touched on both of these. The town did not pay any money for the carport. Instead, a third party paid for the entire installation and they took the tax benefits on the project and charged the town for power. Um, the second point is that these are not watertight and there is no roof decking underneath. Um, there's gaps, which you can see here, about a three eighth of an inch gap between each of the panels. So rainwater will drip through. Um, definitely wanna bring that up, even if Tim had not, to make sure there are no surprises. And if roof decking is used, there's tax implications for that third party uh, owner of the system, so he's not going to be able to get the full tax benefit on the entire construction. So that's the main reason why you don't see roof decking on, on, on PPA products like this. Now, there are gasketed solutions available which can be installed between the panels and minimize that dripping, 
Um, I mean, we definitely would be willing to work with Tim to see if we could retrofit his system um, to see if that would, would help in his situation. Car parts are worth investigating when land and roof space is not an option. On, on this project, which was completed just last month, uh, the roof failed the structural inspection. So the client quickly pivoted to filling his parking lot and making his tenant occupied office building more valuable with this 535 KW carport. It's possible that some of you have grand expectations of solar on the, on the roof of your school, as you should, because rooftop solar is a great cost effective solution. But it's also possible you run into the same scenario and find out that there's no additional structural capacity. So if that happens, your options are to find available ground space for ground mount, investigate carports, or give up on looking into solar. The client here saw the benefit in continuing with solar, and um, this final solution will benefit his tenants for decades to come. We also ran conduit out to these carports um, to prepare for EV chargers that we'll be installing later this year. And you'll find that carports and EV charger products seems to go hand in hand. Custom carports are less common, but they can provide a great benefit. USA Hauling and Recycling, which Stefan mentioned earlier, they require a custom long span covering for their natural gas fleet of trash haulers. Um, these carports were vital for their fleet to prevent snow buildup as it requires a fair amount of effort to remove snow from all their trash haulers after each snowstorm, and they're met with steep fines if that's not done. So the solution was practical, and it helped them complete their vision of combining solar, natural gas, and recycling. Uh, custom carports of this nature, they're, they're definitely less likely to happen um, in, a, in a PPA municipal scenario, but with the right situation or maybe the right grants being obtained, it's worth investigating. Solar carports are not run-of-the-mill electrical projects. Solar panels are installed all across Connecticut every day, typically by electrical contractors who specialize in solar. Solar carports are a completely different solution than the roof and ground mounted solar that we're all so familiar with. Evidence of that is the carport here, which required a driven timber pile foundation underneath a concrete pile cap due to the poor soil conditions. It's vitally important that your electrical contractor be experienced in steel and concrete construction practices. Uh, it's not enough to simply leave the carport installation to the usually out of state uh, carport installers who typically build these structures. At Earthlight, we pride ourselves on going the extra mile to ensure quality installation is provided to our clients, from hiring third party structural engineers to conduct peer reviews to hiring testing laboratories to create concrete cylinders, perform concrete brake tests, from hiring geotechnical engineers to conduct borings, and hiring dewatering trucks to deal with high water tables. All of these play a role in any project we're, we're involved in and prove that this is no simple solar installation. So as you can see here, there's some very complex foundation um, issues that we run into, and you really have to be very versed in, in the construction aspects. So that's why Earthlight thinks it's extremely important for each of you to have control of the contractor you'll be working with who's gonna be overseeing the construction of that carport. So I'd like to share with you some of what we've learned and some of what we've realized is important in ensuring that you have a quality car carport that'll last for decades to come. Geotechnical reports are part of every project that are doing the borings here. So what's going on underneath the ground surface is always unknown. And the results of the borings will determine what size and type of foundation is utilized. It's important to understand these reports as they impact more than just the design. They play a role in determining the project's construction methods. For example, a high water table combined with certain soil types will cause the foundation walls to cave in. So a re review of the geo report ahead of time will help you select the right construction methods, which in that case would involve a combination of steel casings and a dewatering pump truck at the time of installation. Did you know that not all steel is created equal? Heavy gauge steel is a type of steel that's used to construct most of the commercial buildings around us. When you see a building frame going up, typically with the health of a crane, that's heavy gauge steel or structural steel. Go into any big box store today, like a Home Depot and a Lowe's, look at the ceiling, you're looking at heavy gauge steel with those beams, joists, and columns. Light gauge steel is something else entirely. 
It's more commonly used to frame walls in commercial buildings, very similar to the wood studs used in, in building your home. So many in the solar carport industry have resorted to installing major carport components using light gauge steel. So in this picture, you can see the columns, that's heavy gauge steel. You can see the beams, that's heavy gauge. Light gauge is adequate um, for, the small, for the small steel purlins that are used up there at the roof, as you can see in this picture. But it is very important that you're not using those um, for your major structural components. So, and have any of you ever heard of someone backing into a carport column? I've definitely heard of it. If you have a light gauge column, there's a good chance it's gonna be damaged by that car backing into it. If you've got heavy gauge steel, it's more, far more likely that you'll be damaging the car than the column. Is the term cold weather concreting familiar to any of you? If not, that's no surprise. And it's, it's not a familiar term with most electricians that I meet, nor should it be. Their expertise is in electricity and not in concrete placement. Cold weather concrete placement is critical to any carport installation that's taking place anytime the ambient temperatures are below 40 degrees. Concrete that is frozen before it's had time to reach its concrete strength will never reach its design strength. So we don't believe it's good policy to just assume that the carport installers are familiar with this. So we talk to them about it long beforehand. We ask to see their concrete cold weather practices, and then we make sure they're implemented when the situation calls for it. And you don't just start implementing it the day that concrete is placed. You start the day that the hole is dug or it's augered out. You need to cover that hole and make sure that the walls don't freeze because concrete can never be placed against frozen soil. Um, and concrete placed uh, during cold weather, if practices are not used, the right practices are not used, those structural issues are not going to be evident until years later once the installer is gone. So it's just one more reason why you need to select a, a local, really qualified, experienced company to end up with a really quality, long-lasting product. Mounting under canopy lighting is also important, but often overlooked, part of the solar carport design. And it's common for lighting to not even be considered in parking lots that already have their own exterior pole lights. In reality, those canopies will block the light from reaching the carport, the cars below. As a company that got its start in installing energy efficient lighting, and as multiple crews installing lighting every day across the state, we understand the importance of maintaining proper lighting coverage of the parking lot for both safety and function. Light readings are taken when necessary to determine the best solution, which might involve just lowering the existing poles beneath the canopy or switching out the light fixtures with multi-directional lighting or completely replacing the pole lights with energy efficient under canopy lighting. Mm -hmm. So for this recently installed carport in Windsor, we took down the existing poles, took photometric light readings, performed a full design to ensure proper coverage, and then installed the proper lighting necessary to meet the town's light pollution requirements so we didn't impact the residential neighborhoods. Logistics play a larger role in these projects than they do in your average roof or ground array. The holes need to be augered, water, dewatering needs to happen, or maybe there's sloughing of the foundation walls and rebar cages get set. And you can obviously just leave all of that to the carport installer, but there's more than that to coordinate. As you can see in these pictures, the conduits need to run up the columns, so they're set in place before the concrete's even poured. You need to bond the columns for grounding to the rebar cages. You need to have your trenches in place in time, so there's just a lot more coordination that needs to go on, so the experience is very, uh, very necessary. Conducting a site survey is important to understand where everything's located and then help in the construction, um, but it could be easily overlooked that you you don't know what's going on underneath the ground. And I'm not talking about the borings anymore. Too often the existing site plans are incomplete, they're outdated, or they're non-existent. So it's amazing that underground utilities can turn up unexpectedly, but it happens. And hopefully it never happens by somebody running the excavation equipment. We always hire a specialty company to hire ground penetrating radar to conduct that uh, radar test to verify that no obstruction exists in the areas of the car carport foundations or the trenches themselves. And on the topic of underground utilities, um, in the rare instance that we do have roof decking, which is usually part of a commercial space where they have very specific um, needs for that, 
the drainage needs to be designed adequately and then coordinated with the on-site conditions so the downspout does just end up on the pavement and you end up with serious icing conditions. Mm -hmm. So the drainage needs to end up in a non-paved area that's suitable for accepting the flow of water or as was done here, tied directly underground to the catch basin. So hopefully I didn't scare you off of solar carports with all these hurdles that I just mentioned, but simply reinforce the notion that selecting an experienced qualified contractor is critical to your project success. Uh, thanks, Eric. Uh, picking up from there, um, I think these points uh, kind of highlight the fact that a solar carport or canopy really does resemble a construction project. Uh, clearly, because of a, the, the solar and renewables aspect of these uh, projects, they can also resemble a roof-mounted or ground-mounted uh, solar project. Uh, so when a town or a business wants to explore uh, a solar canopy, um, it's sometimes difficult to determine whether or not this should be investigated as a construction project or a solar project. And what we found as a developer is that the default seems to uh, approach it as a typical solar project. Um, whereas we would recommend kind of a hybrid approach, so we'll kind of get into that. But just by way of, of just some very broad strokes uh, uh, framing of how towns will approach some of these decisions. And again, this is very broad strokes. Every town generally has their own processes. But a construction project is going to, you know, it's going to take into account a lot of those potential variables that Eric was talking about. And the way that it would be uh, uncovered is by doing some feasibility, feasibility studies. There are possibly even some development costs that are incurred to uh, do some boring or, or actually going back to a construction project, maybe uh, do some design work. There's a capital expenditure that's expected generally during that time, as well as for the actual build. Uh, and then once all of those known, unknowns are known, uh, a bid goes out and, and uh, the, the agreed, agreed upon scope of work can be bid. Uh, by qualified contractors, and you know, you start doing the classic kind of request for proposals based on a well-defined scope of work. Uh, and then, as as things happen and, and things change, it's, it's expected that there would be uh, some adjustments and uh, change orders, which are all individually reviewed and agreed upon. And then, at the end of the day, it's a town-owned asset. So it's a because the town is going to own it and take responsibility for this. I think all of that due diligence is very uh, justified and uh, become part of the standard process. Typical solar projects that we bid, uh, in, particularly in Connecticut, um, are much more vague than that. There's usually uh, maybe a few, a, a few preferred locations, uh, but there's really no upfront cost expected by the town. Um, the RFPs don't have a design or anything. They're just looking for solutions as well as the pricing to go along with it. Uh, very limited information is provided to the developers, uh, resulting in multiple designs presented and multiple sets of uh, assumptions. Uh, so it makes it difficult for town leaders to decide uh, which is really the best way to go. Uh, developers are expected to assume a lot of the risks of the unknowns. And, and I think that's because solar, uh, in a traditional sense, it's a retrofit. Uh, it is a little easier to limit those unknowns because you can see everything you're working on, whether it's the roof, you know, the roof or the electrical room. Uh, and then finally, because it's a third party owned asset, um, there's, longer, there's longer legs on the incentives for the people who are gonna own it. And maybe they can tolerate some of those limited unknowns a little bit more. Uh, so kind of continuing on that, uh, because these systems or traditional systems are retrofitted, uh, it's easy to identify what the approximate scope, scope of the project would be, uh, what type of electrical configuration is needed to tie into that building. And in those cases, the energy savings is the primary reason for the RFP. Let's try to get it. Let's try to find a way for the, uh, the community to save some money, maybe go a little bit green. And that objective is pretty straightforward. Um, uh, whereas with a carport, uh, there might be secondary reasons uh, to, to install it, as, uh, as I think Tim had mentioned, as well as what Eric talked about with the town of Vernon. And again, the savings to investment ratio on uh, a, a traditional solar project is a little bit wider. And what I mean by that is uh, the, the cost, the initial cost to build a roof or a ground mounted solar array. Uh, that, that's where all the incentives are designed around, right? Uh, so if there are some changes and some risks that need to be put in there, that's already built in to the, the market price of what a roof uh, or a ground-mounted solar array is. 
uh, carports don't really fit that mold. There's much more risk there. Uh, and the incentives uh, in Connecticut don't compensate for that. Uh, so that really means that the carport is going to need to be a little bit more uh, closely defined in order to make sure that um, the developers aren't assuming too much risk. Because an unintended consequence here of any of these types of RFPs is that the winner of the project could simply be the developer who was willing to take the greatest risk. And that's not really where you, you want to be because you could get a few months into it and if they rolled the dice on a project and you know some things didn't go their way, you might not get a project at all and you've wasted a lot of time and resources exploring something that didn't get built. Um, the, uh, the traditional solar systems are going to be third party owned. Uh, and again, that long term benefit, I'm sorry, long term risk goes to uh, somebody else. So I think it, 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 it provides for an environment where a town might say, well, it's, it's not really ours. It's not our equipment. So uh, we can let somebody else worry about the reliability of it. Uh, but that's not really going to be the case with a solar canopy because, uh, again, you want to make sure that it's performing uh, as, a, as an asset to the town, even though it might be owned by a third party. Uh, there's equipment and product reasons to be uh, you know, familiar with what it is that you're getting. So given those variables inherent in the development of a solar canopy, it's advisable to partner with developers who can guide that process and that project to adapt to variables as they're uncovered. So those, those core sample studies, the electrical reviews, uh, you know, the feedback from the town as to what the functionality of this carport could be. Lumping solar canopies into the same uh, uh, category as a typical solar project can yield poor or non-existent results. Uh, so consider these points. Like a construction project, solar canopies can provide for outcomes beyond just the cost savings. So you want to explore why you would want a carport in the first place. If it's, if it's just to preserve land or just to avoid a roof, uh, that's one thing, but let's think about what else it could do. And uh, try to partner with that developer because if you ask them to uh, assume too much risk, uh, with risk comes reward, you know, and it needs to be priced in. And, and, and rolling the dice could uh, result in uh, very high bids or maybe no bids at all if the developers feel that there's just a little bit too much risk and, and too many unknowns. So the way we would recommend approaching this is, is kind of a hybrid of those two purchasing models that we mentioned before. Uh, it, it's a journey. So by qualifying your installer through say uh, uh, an RFQ, uh, instead of a, actually, go ahead and, you know, Eric, now I'll hang on this. Sorry, I was skipping ahead, so let me slow down. Uh, by partnering with an installer to really understand what the scope of work is going to be, uh, you can work together and uncover those variables and design a system that, that approaches those things. Now, these solar arrays do, uh, they are eligible for the same types of creative financing that a, that a, uh, a rooftop or a ground mount is, uh, is eligible for. It's just, you gotta, you gotta firm up those variables before you go shopping out the, uh, the financing. So the incentives that Karen talked about before, the Z-Rex, obviously the electrical savings and net metering and the tax credits, even though they're not directly um, assignable to the town, they can be reassigned to third parties and passed through in various ways. Uh, PPAs is certainly a popular way to do it, but there are others as well. On the left side here, the financing, uh, you also have capital leases and operating leases, uh, depending on the type of entity. Municipalities can't take advantage of CPACE loans directly, uh, but it's possible that in your community, it's a non-municipal building that you're considering. Next slide. So I kind of jumped ahead here a minute ago, but uh, a request for qualifications is an interesting way to go about it instead of saying uh, an RFP or a request for proposals. Instead of jumping right to what do you guys think the solution would look like, maybe, maybe take a more uh, a, a deliberate approach to finding out who it is you're asking for ideas from. So by qualifying the experience of contractors and understanding their track record for success and what they've done for other, uh, for other uh, communities, it's a great way to make sure that the outcome of the project will have the desired result. And believe it or not, a RFP can go out at a later time for the financing solution. So who is going to own this project? Who is going to pass through the most benefit in the long term? Uh, those Xerex are paid out for 15 years. The tax credits equate to almost 50% of the project cost. 
uh, if it's a PPA and there's a 20 year revenue stream there, there's a lot more money to be found in the financing of these projects than in maybe some you know, margin on, on the construction of that project. So once those things are known, the, 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 the financing entities uh, uh, could bid on that project and provide the lowest rate to, to own and hold that uh, equipment. Also, if they have a good understanding as to the integrity of that system, uh, they're not going to be as concerned about ongoing O&M costs and risks uh, uh, to that third party. Uh, so again, they could be able to pass through lower pricing. Uh, and those variables would include the installation costs. You know, is it going to be eight tiers for this uh, carport, or is it going to be 16 based on the the, the findings from the geotechnical uh, reports? Uh, what equipment is going to be spec'd out? How's that performance expected to uh, uh, to play out over time? Now that all of the variables are understood, um, what are the electrical savings? Um, and then finally, the expected incentives. All of these things are much more bankable at this point, uh, which can result in more competent bids from uh, financing partners. And by way of an example, we have this next slide here, Eric. So going back to the town of Vernon, what was interesting here is uh, originally the system was going to go on the roof of that school to the lower right of the photo. Uh, it failed structural, and I think a, a natural thought would be to look at the parking lot uh, out in front of the school there and say, well, let's maybe put some solar there. Uh, there was some interest in the, school, in the town already for some solar carports uh, at the police department. Um, unfortunately, the, the economics of tying into the police department, so that's the blue arrow pointing over to the police department, uh, weren't as good as bringing it over to the school. Uh, the school had a different rate structure that provided for greater electrical savings, but the functionality of the covered parking would actually benefit the police department more. So in this case, it was determined that putting the carports over uh, for the uh, police fleet uh, was, the, was the better way to go. Uh, that lower long array uh, that that actually does have area reserved for faculty of the school as well. And then those yellow arrows kind of indicate that the, the power was actually routed over to the school um, where the energy was actually worth much more in terms of cost savings for the town. So the type of things that if you wanted to go out into your community and look for uh, possible areas that could be explored a bit more, uh, there are a few criteria that could help you qualify and minimize the, uh, the challenges uh, that you can qualify these projects. So the solar offtaker, that would be the, the, uh, the account that, uh, that, you know, the meter that we'd be tying into, you'd want to have a relatively high electrical need. As Tim was saying, economies of scale are a big deal in solar canopies. If you're rolling that concrete truck out there uh, for, for, you know, for um, uh, eight piers as opposed to you know, 28 piers. Uh, it's really just a material cost difference at that point, not really the truck roll and the labor going into it. Also, the design of each of those piers is generally going to be identical. So you're designing it once and rubber stamping it for uh, all the other ones, and, unless there's some unique bindings underground. Uh, so you're looking for uh, electrical uh, uh, electrical need in excess of 250,000 kilowatt hours a year. Uh, just back of the envelope, that might be about $3,500 per month on your electric bill. Uh, the land should be more earthen than rock. Uh, clearly, if there's a lot of obstructions and we're not going to be able to do traditional piers and everything's going to have to be kind of custom mounted, that can drive up the cost. You might not know that. You might not know if underground there's hazardous materials or, or possible concerns. Um, until, uh, until those core samples are pulled up. Uh, but that, again, is part of that process where the RFQ process and, and, and uh, partnering with an experienced contractor can really help you out. And then again, uh, going back to that, the Vernon example, uh, solar doesn't impact all electric accounts the same way. Um, so what you really need to do is look at those bills and look at the, the ones that are, have more KWH fees. So that's your supply charge and some of the transmission charges. Believe it or not, some municipal and not-for-profit um, electric accounts are entirely based on KWH fees. So for example, rate 40 or rate five. So if you see any bills like that, that also have a high usage, this is Eversource uh, in particular, UI obviously would have a different rate name that I, I don't know offhand. Um, but if you see types, those types of bills um, in, in the ledger uh, for the, for the uh, 
for the any of the community buildings that you're looking at. Uh, that could be a great place to start because if you look at the value of solar energy fed back into a rate 30, which is a typical commercial and industrial uh, electric account, that's going to be worth about 10 and a half, 11 cents, maybe as high as 13, 14 cents. Um, but the typical value of a rate 40, uh, so for every kilowatt hour of solar you generate, you're going to save that account about 18 and a half cents at least. I, I, you know, we've seen these as you know over 20 cents uh, per kilowatt hour. So that could be you know, 75 to 100 percent more value pound for pound. So again, uh, in that Vernon example, it was a no-brainer for us to just lengthen the trench a little bit, bring it over to the to the other school, and um, and and really provide more uh, bottom line benefit uh, to the town. Earthlight Technologies was founded in 2008 as an energy efficient lighting company located in Ellington, Connecticut. Shortly after opening, business activities expanded to include other energy saving goods and services for both residential and business markets. From a single employee in 2008, Earthlight has grown to 95 full-time employees. In 2020, about seven megawatts of solar were installed, roughly half for businesses and, and half for residences. As I mentioned before, 2015 brought our first modest carport installation, which has been followed up by carports of every shape and size, some very custom long span carports. Earthlight's been a master dealer for Sun Power, the industry leading solar panel manufacturer since 2017, and was named as Regional Dealer of the Year by Sun Power in 2019 and again in 2021. The Earthlight team is three main characteristics that we pride ourselves on experience, integrity, and scalability. With experience dating back to the 1980s, we're able to bring on any size or complexity of project. Integrity is what our customers appreciate the most. If mistakes are made or there's a misunderstanding with the client, we go the extra mile to correct the issue. As a family-owned business with six members of the Schneider family playing prominent roles in both leadership and day-to-day -day operations, we're well-suited to continue to grow and scale for decades to come. At this point, Mark, if you'd like to let us know some of the questions that have been coming in, unless um, Steph wants to jump into any that we had seen come in earlier. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you, gentlemen. That was absolutely fantastic. A um, lot of, lot of um, clearly a lot of insights from um, your experience in this field. Um, the pictures are stunning. I could look at these things all day. Um, so I think we have addressed a fair number of the questions already. There was a, there were quite a few questions related to maintenance and whether um, you have spaces between the panels, whether you could put spacers between the panels, mm -hmm. or the use of decking. What uh, what do you do most? Uh, you know what's most common in your in your in your projects, and then what's the implication then for ice and snow and um, mm -hmm. water runoff? Sure. So as far as, as snow goes, um, you don't want the snow sliding off the carports into an area where pedestrians are going to be walking. So there's different situations that we've seen. We've seen snow ending up in an area where nobody's going to be. They don't, they don't do anything. They let it end up there. But that's not usually the case. So we put snow guards up. So snow, snow guards would be at the bottom of the array, and it holds the snow there. And then the snow melts off on its own. Um, obviously, yes, it does impact the production, and we have to take that into account with our design, but that's a better scenario than slow or sheets of ice landing on people. So we only omit the, uh, the snow guards if it's, if it's going to slide into an area that would be landing on people. Um, there's a gasketed solution for going between the panels. Um, we haven't seen many people ask for it yet, but maybe after talking to Tim, they will. Um, I think it might be interesting to go back and talk to some of the people that have had them for a while and find out if their experiences were similar. Um, was there a third question within that? Yeah, Eric, this is Bernie. I, I have a couple follow-ons to that. Um, sure. A, a number of folks asked, asked about snow removal, whether it be a heating strip that would melt the, melt the snow or otherwise facilitate it sliding off. And going back to your your gasket observation, would that would sort of retrofitting a gasket between the three eighths inch gap have the same impact on the PPA tax status as uh, the decking underneath it? 
It would not. So it's a good question. Mm -hmm. So the reason that the tax implication is if it's sitting there with a roof deck on it before you put solar, it, it could exist without the solar. It's just a carport at that point. Whereas here, it's the racking structure for the carport. So if the panels weren't there as a covering, there'd be no point for those columns and beams to be there. So it's 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 an integral part of the car of the of the solar canopy. So adding gaskets that would not change that from a tax component side at all. Um, these well, I can questions. add to this. Yeah, I can I can add a little bit to that. You know, one one of the things that's important to note mm -hmm. is that uh, the functionality of these carports as a consideration is what we're clearly just you know is seeing in this conversation now. So when it comes to the, you know, the savings aspect of the system, uh, it's always going to be a conversation on, on priorities on cost because a carport is already going to be a dollar to a dollar fifty per watt more expensive than a typical ground-mounted solar in uh, installation uh, because of the the the, uh, the higher cost materials, um, the, the the greater structural integrity required as well as generally some of the elected options that the carports go for, whether it be lighting or water management or snow management. Uh, but there's a lot of ways to do that based on um, uh, the different manufacturers of the equipment or the, the site implications, which way is the snow going? Is it a problem? Is it not a problem? Do you need protection on one side of the array but not the other side of the array? Uh, so there are a lot of ways to, to engineer that in uh, without over budgeting for those types of solutions. Um, it's also not a huge problem to have the snow dwell on top of the carport for a particularly long period of time because it's happening during the time of year where solar energy is the weakest. So if you if you lose a, a week of production on 25% of the array because snow has accumulated and it hasn't come down or melted yet, it's not going to have a huge impact on the annual production of the solar array. Uh, obviously, if you had snow on the system in the middle of July, <laughs> which wouldn't happen, you'd be missing out on some very valuable sunny days. Uh, so that's generally just not the case uh, in, in the winter time. And just like to jump back to a question I was asked earlier about whether or not bifacial should be investigated on a carport. Um, we've all walked on pavement in the summer at some point, whether we were kids or whether it was recently in barefoot and you, you feel that heat. Um, that sun is getting soaked up into the pavement. It's not reflecting off that pavement. So bifacial is not, not the right use of panels for something like this because you're not getting much um much sunlight bouncing back to the other side of the car of the carport. Great. Um one one question that I think Stefan you started to answer it just for people's uh, benefit order of magnitude cost differential between commercial rooftop ground mounted and solar canopies I think you said Solar canopies versus ground mount is on the order of a dollar to a dollar fifty more a watt. Can you sort of just lay out the three rough price points, starting with commercial rooftop? Very broad strokes. I would say a ground mount would be about um, maybe a dollar yeah. more per watt. So if, if you have your typical roof mount at two dollars to two fifty, your ground mount is going to be from three dollars to three fifty. Um, and your roof mount could be somewhere around four dollars per watt. I mean, yeah. Eric, feel free to. Yeah, it's, Vern, it's a really hard question to answer because yeah. it depends on if you're talking a 50 kW, a hundred, a 500, or a megawatt, and it also depends on what kind of panels you're talking about. Are you talking about off-the-shelf panels called Tier One panels with a 10-year warranty, or are you talking about panels with a 25-year warranty? So that to be able to answer that um, would be very difficult. I think you gave the order of magnitude sort of differential. And um, a, a question that I think has also come up multiple times is the relationship, actually you guys sort of hinted at it too, is the relationship between a solar canopy and EV chargers. Uh, what, what are sort of the different ways you've seen that married up? And I think Steve Wagner has a question, can we just use the same cable as the solar panels? Uh, what, what extra apparatus is needed to, to put chargers of different sorts? Yes, yeah, so you're you're running. Um, it's going to be powered from your uh, your electrical panel, just like anything else in your building is. So you're running a separate conduit or conduits out to your carport um, for those EV chargers. 
Yeah, the canopy represents a great uh, opportunity for that because let's say you weren't doing solar canopies, but you wanted the EV chargers. Most parking lots are not wired with high amperage feeders from the mechanical room to bring that power out to where the cars are. So if you're fortunate enough to have cars that are lined up right adjacent to the building, then that could be an easy application for EV chargers. Uh, but if you have a remote parking lot, when you're doing that canopy and we have to pipe that power back to the building anyway, it's a great time to drop those extra conduits in because uh, it's very inexpensive. But all the expensive work has already been done. So just add those extra sticks, pull, put some pull wires in there and stub them up for a future application. And now where the cars, everybody's going to everybody's going to go to that shaded parking spot. Uh, more and more of those are EVs in the future. There's going to be an opportunity to tie that in. Uh, that would uh, that would increase the electrical need, demand on the building, of course, because now you're charging cars and providing fuel. Uh, so that could also be considered in the sizing of the array based on the the, the future goals of the town as they develop uh, a carport as well. There were a couple of questions related to zoning and planning issues. Um, what kind of things do you run into? Um, you know, height issues. There's a question about uh, some parking requirements uh, requ requiring trees in parking lots. What are some of the, you know, permitting and zoning issues you run into? Uh, some towns have maximum height requirements, so they don't allow what they call um, an auxiliary structure. I think some towns put carports into that category. They don't require them over a certain height. I, we've run into 15 feet before, and we have gone for variance. We have we have been successful, Matt. Um, some towns have put a moratorium on carports, and then you just you have your basic um, setback requirements, and um, you don't have impermeable lot coverage type issues because that you might have on a ground array because you're putting it over a paved surface anyway, so that's already impermeable. So you're going through, you're getting a normal building permit just like everywhere else. And each town, there's not like a standard. So um, each town handles things a little bit differently, but more, more or less the same. Yeah, I have think you the thing to be paying attention to be paying attention to is how the project is being received because there will be a lot of interpretation because there's not going to be a ton of precedent for a project like this. So is it a solar ray? Is it a canopy? Is it a is it a uh, auxiliary structure? Is it a uh, so th those definitions can be interpreted by the building officials in different ways. So it's very worthwhile to have a conversation about uh, what the goals of the town would be and and to uh, encourage the inclusion of, of multiple departments uh, from the town uh, to, to, to make sure that those priorities are addressed and aligned. There's a question about um, multi-level parking garages. Have you ever built one on the upper tier of a multi-level parking garage? Oh, we have not. We have investigated it thoroughly. There's been there's a few opportunities in front of us now. But we haven't completed one of those yet. Great. Well, there are uh, there are other questions, but um, what I'd like to do is switch gears a little bit and um, just talk a little bit about, as I mentioned before, this call to action. Uh, but uh, Stefan and Eric, thank you again. That was a uh, an incredibly interesting and informative presentation.